Hello everyone, welcome again to Modeling Methods and Mechanical Engineering, and we are going to continue our discussion on the use of the method of separation of variables and superposition for cylindrical coordinate systems. And now we're going to look at what happens when the problem is transient, when it's no longer steady state. So when the time coordinate actually shows up in the equation and it's a dependency of the dependent variable, uh, then the same uh, criteria and the same conditions for the applicability of the separation of variables method applies. So essentially the problem has to be fully homogeneous everywhere in its space, so in all directions R, theta, and Z, if those, if those dimensions actually apply. And the only non-homogeneity has to appear in the initial condition or in the set of initial conditions if you have a weight problem with the second kind or second derivative in, in time, um, for which you need two initial conditions. Um, so basically, if you don't have those conditions, then you'll have to apply superposition. And normally what we did in the Cartesian coordinate case is that we superimpose a steady problem to a transient problem and transfer all the space non homogeneities to the steady problem and kept the transient problem fully homogeneous in space and non homogeneous in time. So the same condition will apply and I will show you how do we go about actually solving this type of problem. So this is modeling methods me and uh, what we're going to look at separation variables for transient problems in cylindrical coordinate systems. Let's say that uh, we, let's just show the geometry. It's the axis, and then let's make this the R axis. And what we're gonna have is uh, start with a problem up here. And let's assume that this is a hollow cylinder. That. So um, we'll translate this down to here, all the way to the bottom. This is solid, and uh, and then the bottom we have a. this and uh, assume again that uh, this is A, this is B, this is uh, Z equal 0 and Z equal L, and then the theta direction, the tangential coordinate is counterclockwise in that direction, and we have a full circle, right, so we don't have a wedge full circle. So let's assume for a moment in this particular example, assume for this example that t is not a function of theta. So it's axis symmetric. Axis symmetric. And also assume that t is not a function of z. So symmetry on Z axis. The axis of rotation is symmetric as well. So we are going to basically assume for this example that temperature is a function of radius of the radial coordinate and time only. The governing equation, and if we're again illustrating these using the um, diffusion equation and not the wave equation, T of R and T, Laplace on one side, and on the other side we have the diffusivity coefficient, dt dt of R and T. And uh, let's assume that we have initial condition T R and zero equals some T zero of R, given some initial condition where the temperature depends on R, and 
given boundary conditions, let's say on the interior of the cylinder, Q is equal to zero, so it's insulated. That means that minus K dt dr times the normal vector, which is minus one, I'm sorry, minus one, and the interior at R equal A, R equal A is equal to zero, and therefore dt dr at r equal a is equal to zero. And the other condition, let's make it the same. Let's say that the cylinders isolated are r equal b. That means the minus k dt dr at r equal b times the normal vector, which is positive one, is equal to zero, but that doesn't change anything because simply dt dr at r equal b is equal to zero. So we're illustrating how to do uh, these type of problems with a radial problem that's transient and it has second kind boundary conditions, homogeneous on both sides. So separation of variables directly applies. So separation of variables applies. So we have homogeneous boundary conditions and non-homogeneous um, initial condition. Remember, we also have, also, we have homogeneous governing equation. That's important. Otherwise, you need another level of superposition. So, as always, we let T of R and Z and T be equal to R of R tau of T. And that means that the Laplace equation with the Laplace operator on the left hand side reduces to and on the right hand side you just simply dt dt of r and t. Again, uh, we're going to do this in, if we plug this in here, we end up with the usual r double prime of r divided by r of r plus 1 over r, r prime of r divided by r of r is equal to 1 over alpha tau prime of t divided by tau of t, which, as you can see by the same arguments that we used a million times already, the left-hand side is only a function of r, the right-hand side is a function of theta, and we use the separation constant lambda square, and we're going to make it negative to build an eigenvalue in the r direction, but more importantly, so that the response in, the in time will be a negative exponential. And the, pro the problem will actually diffuse away rather than grow forever. So in the t direction, the solution is tau prime of t plus lambda square alpha tau of t is equal to zero, which will simply result in, which will simply result in a times e to the minus alpha lambda square t, the usual negative exponential decay is proportional to lambda square, which would be the absolute eigenvalue for this problem. So that doesn't change if the problem is Cartesian, cylindrical, or even spherical, um, or any other coordinate system. The problem in time doesn't change. So in the R direction, we have this problem, R square, lambda square, R of R is equal to zero, plus a couple of first or second order boundary conditions, one that says our prime of A is equal to zero, and our prime of B is equal to zero. Okay. We were given second time boundary conditions that were homogeneous and therefore they are separable. Okay. I'm going to do this by hand, but again, you can always go to the table, look, at, look up this problem on the table for hollow cylinders, and find what the eigenfunction is, the eigenvalues and uh, the norm. So the solution of this problem, this is the Bessel function of order zero. It would be the Bessel function. This is a Bessel equation of order zero. The result or the solution of this problem, the general solution is in terms of the Bessel functions of order zero. Uh, dy zero of lambda r. Right, that's the general solution. The derivative of r of the Bessel function of order zero is the negative of the Bessel function of order one. And the derivative of the Bessel function, the 
of the second column of order zero would be the negative of the sec of the vessel function of the second kind of order one. So if we impose the boundary condition, our prime of A is equal to minus C lambda J1 of lambda A minus D lambda Y1 of lambda A and our prime of B, and this is equal to zero, is equal to minus C lambda J1 of lambda B minus D lambda Y1 of lambda B and that's equal to zero. So we have these set of equations. We can use this to put D in terms of C. We cannot make both C and D equal zero, remember, because otherwise we'll yield the trivial solution. So basically we can say that D is equal to minus C times J1 of lambda A divided by Y1 of lambda A. So we can solve for D from equation number one, for instance. We can do it from equation number two. It doesn't make a difference. At the end, you'll get exactly the same. By the way, this is A, not B. Okay, so we're solving for D from equation number one, and then we're plugging that into equation number two. So we get uh, minus C lambda J1 of lambda B, so equation number two, minus D, which is minus C J1 of lambda A, Y1 of lambda A, um, times Y1 of lambda B, should be equal to zero. And then uh, we can take uh, the C as a common factor, and this would be, the C and the lambda actually can come out as a common factor. C lambda, and then I can have, uh, I can multiply both sides by y1. So this would be j1 lambda b times y1 of lambda a plus, oh, this is not a plus, this is a minus, so this is minus minus plus, so this will be minus j1 of lambda a times y1 lambda b and all of these divides y1 of lambda a is a common factor is equal to zero so again we go to the same argument that either this is equal to zero or this is equal to zero but this one cannot be equal to zero because then that will make c equal zero and that will basically mean that the solution will be trivial so basically y1 i'm sorry in the same order, J1 of lambda B times Y1 of lambda A minus J1 of lambda A times Y1 of lambda B must be equal to zero. And that is the relation for the eigenvalues. This is the implicit, implicit, remember this is a J, not a Y, Implicit equation or relation for eigenvalues lambda n. So this is, has to do with a combination of the roots of j1, y1, a lambda a, and a lambda b. This can also be found. This can also be found in on table for hollow cylinders. So if we go to the table that I've provided online, we can go to four hollow cylinders, case number five, where the boundary condition on the left and on the right, or at r equal a and r equal b are both zero, and of the second kind, the relation for the eigenvalues goes like this. By the way, the original equation posted here is the Bessel equation of order nu. But in this case, nu is equal to zero, right? And all that remains is beta square r on the last term, which is basically the eigenvalues beta. The expression for the eigenvalues are given by j prime of zero, nu is equal to zero, which is j1, y prime of zero, uh, which is y1, minus 
so on and so forth. And that's the expression that relates to the eigenvalues. The eigenfunctions go like this. Okay, we can deduce that ourselves too. Um, and, uh, and the expression for the norm is pi square over 2, or the inverse of the norm, pi square over 2 divided by, or multiplied times this long term right here. So that's the integral of the eigenfunction square. Now to find the eigenfunction, why does the eigenfunction turn out to be this way? Let's go back to the notes and then say back to eigenfunction. And we had already determined that the general solution is j0 lambda r times c plus d times y0 lambda r. But we've already placed d in terms of c by using one of the boundary conditions. So, so r of r is c times j0 lambda r plus d, which we found to be c times j1 lambda a y1 lambda a times y0 lambda r. And all we have to do now is take the c as a common factor. So r of r is equal to c as a common factor. I'm also going to take y1 of lambda a as a common factor. And that is equal to or multiplies j0 lambda r times y1 lambda a um, minus j1 lambda a times y0 lambda r. And this term right here, this constant divided by y1 of lambda a, this is also a constant, can be actually denoted as r of r. This is the eigenvalue, eigenfunction, I'm sorry. And we're going to call this E times J0 lambda R, Y1 lambda A minus J1 lambda A, Y0 lambda R. And these, also found in the table, as we saw, are the eigenfunctions. Minus a constant, obviously, but it's just the eigenfunctions. All right, so now we assemble the full solution. Assembling the general solution. So we end up with T as a function of R and T which is r of r, tau of t is, um, so this in this case will be e0 plus the summation from n equal 1 to infinity e sub n times all this, this long eigenfunction here, j0, let me squeeze it in here, j on y1 of lambda a, minus j1 of lambda a times y0 of lambda r times e to the minus lambda alpha lambda n square t. So the reason why I broke that up into two is because this particular case where we have two second time under conditions on r equal a and r equal b, it's a special case, if we look at the table, again, we find that this is a special case. There's a star right here for this particular case, beta zero. The first eigenvalue is also eigenvalue uh, corresponding to an eigenfunction one, right? And to a norm two over b squared minus a squared, which are the radii, the outer radii, radius, and the inner radius. So this is always a special case when we have two second time under conditions. Uh, so basically, go back to the notes. This means that uh, this is a special case on eigenfunction table for hollow cylinders. with our prime of a equals zero and our prime of b equals
equals zero. So second time boundary conditions on both sides. That says basically that R of R is equal to, the eigenfunction is equal to one if N is equal to zero, and it's that big function J zero, lambda NR, that's an R, Y one, lambda NA, minus J one, lambda N, A, Y zero, lambda NR, if N is greater or equal than one. Okay, that's why I broke this up into two, because one of the uh, lambdas, or the first second function is equal to zero for n is equal to zero. So the first second function is equal to one for n is equal to zero. And beta, or the eigenfunction is beta is equal to zero for that eigenfunction, and therefore e to the zero will be equal to one. So that's the first expansion. Now we're gonna use the initial condition says that t uh, r comma zero is equal to t zero of r given and uh, and basically apply orthogonality just plug it in here and apply orthogonality to determine e sub n but again because this is a special case we have to do it twice one e sub zero would be the would be the inverse of the norm uh, for lambda zero, inverse of the norm for lambda zero, um, times the integral from a to b of f, I'm sorry, not f, t zero of r times r dr, this is the initial condition. And e sub n, equal to 1 over n of lambda n of the integral from a to b of t0 of r times r times the full eigenfunction lambda r lambda n r y1 of lambda n a minus j1 of lambda n a times y0 of lambda n r dr. Again, we only have to do it twice because um, this is that special case where the first eigenfunction at n equals zero is different, it's one. Um, this is uh, such that n of lambda zero and n of lambda n from table. Okay, so that's uh, that's it. That's how you address uh, these type of problems for homogeneous in space, and only the radial direction and non-homogeneous initial condition. Uh, if they're not like that, remember you have to use superposition to construct homogeneous problems in, 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 in the transient realm. And then the non-homogeneous are passed through steady problems and then we address them uh, with uh, using the same approach in which you addressed all these non-homogeneous uh, cylindrical problems for R and theta, R and Z, and R theta and Z. So this is it. This is uh, the end of the discussion for uh, the use of uh, separation of variables and superposition for solving partial differential equations and cylindrical coordinates. And we illustrated this whole thing using the diffusion equation. But again, this applies to many other types of equations as well. So again, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you next class.